SELFSI, Spoken Easy Language for Social Inclusion. Great. Thanks, Pierre. And thanks so much for this opportunity um, to join uh, your seminar today. Um, having met Pierre when he came to Melbourne as I was flying back, uh, racing back from um, Vienna, um, where I'd just been to a conference. So yes, I've been, um, I, I'm a speech pathologist, um, and I think it's a really interesting um, cross-collaboration to be having, to be thinking about what it is that our profession actually has and does and what you're trying to achieve around easy spoken language. Um, I My background is in working with people with multiple and complex needs. So most of the people I work with don't have a lot of speech. Um, and I've actually for the last 18 years been writing um, Easy English in Australia, um, which is actually simpler than Easy Read and wrote the Australian guidelines um, for that. So I'm going to pop up my screen and hopefully the technology is all working happily and I'm going to be allowed to actually do that, which is always a good sign when that happens. Oh, except that I've got it sitting at the end, not the beginning. Let me just take that up. Okay, so... Um, I run a team, um, my business is called Access Easy English. Um, I'm based in Melbourne, but my team is actually virtual. So I don't actually have an office. Um, we all come in together um, and work virtually online. Um, where my business sits and why I'm really interested in this topic is that our specialist service actually has a vision that we include people with low literacy in all the work that we do, um, in how we interact and how we communicate. And the easy English is the tool. It's how you interact, which is what, you know, what you're sort of looking at here, which becomes really critical. Um, if you actually don't know how to interact with someone, the easy English, the easy Italian, the easy whatever it is that you're creating just becomes a white elephant. So just to show you the sorts of things that we do here in Australia to then link it up with what you're doing here with Easy Spoken Language is on the left is what is um, Easy English and on the right is Easy Read. And it was lovely to hear Floriana, who I've heard speak um, at Clara, um, talk about, um, you know, the easy language space, but also what is it that actually makes things different? What are we measuring? And I've done a lot of work around measuring what is happening linguistically um, in the easy um, English versus the easy read, which is what a lot of um, English spoken stuff is called. And that's what most people write. No one else writes it at the level that we do. When we actually did the analysis, and um, thank you for introducing the readability idea about reading, is that easy read comes in at an average of grade three to grade 10 with an average of grade five. That does not equate to any person with low literacy that I've ever met. In fact, of all the young people I've ever met, no one else, none of them would have had literacy at that level. That's not what we're aiming at. Easy English comes in at zero to grade three with an average of grade two. So grade two is about, um, so that's your third year of primary school when you're still learning to read. You might have a bit of a handle on it, but you're still really struggling with it. As you can see, there's lots of white space, very short words, um, this is an example where we've got a negative explanation rather than a positive, but it was around a negative concept. And there's many, many examples of this sort of stuff on the website. Why am I showing you this? Because what we can do is we can actually measure and in the guidelines that we use and that we trade against that we can measure and we can repeat constantly the language that's actually in the um, in the easy English that we're writing. And so you look at things like the structure of words. We actually look at the structure of the word in terms of its consonant, vowel consonant. Now, it's interesting to hear Floriana talk about, but we're not planning it when we speak. But when we actually have written information like this that is easy to read, a support person now has got something that they can base their spoken language around. The most common used word that we have is a consonant, vowel, consonant word, something like dog and cat. We can measure the number of syllables in words. We're aiming for one, maybe two syllable words. This is what is easy. 
this is how you get content that people with really low literacy, but also difficulty understanding their world who need easy spoken language. We keep repeating words and even in spoken language. So it's interesting to hear um, from the feedback that you've had on your surveys, the use of, you know, keep repeating, keep repeating. Easy English repeats words. We don't keep coming up with new language. We have common words that we use. What are the top 10 words we use? The length of our sentences. Now, we can shorten our sentences when we do spoken language. The length of a sentence in easy English is five to eight words. In easy read, it goes up to 14. That's not a short sentence. And most people are not aware that they actually are speaking at that length. We look at our spelling rules and we're doing a bit of work with um, in South Korea. You know, what are the spelling rules that we have in English that don't equate to other country languages? But we, you know, we think about in English, for many of you who know a bit of English, um, that you can look at um, what we have as regular spelling rules and we have irregular spelling rules. And we're trying to always use spelling, the regular spelling rules. And then we have things like, um, you know, all our text is in active tense. What's here that we can translate across into the rest of our communication? And what skills do you need to support the accessible written content. And that's where listening to all the presentations this morning, what you're talking about is the sorts of things that help people engage in this space. What's fascinating though is I, one of my staff members actually has a daughter who actually doesn't use speech. And when she when she heard that I was speaking about, um, you know, coming to a conference that was speaking about spoken language, she said, well, how does that work for my daughter? Are we talking about the same thing? What are we really talking about? And so I need you to start thinking about what is it about the interaction? So it's not just the language. The language is one arm of it. I want to challenge you to think about what are we actually doing? What is it that the person sending the message is doing? And what does the other person receive? Communication is two-way and it's about what we both bring to that conversation that we need to be much more aware of. And so it's about the interaction that occurs. It doesn't matter how fantastic or how short a sentence you use, if it actually doesn't do what it's meant to do on the other side of the equation, it's not communication. And at the end of the day, that's what we're all trying to do is to communicate. So we need to stop and think about, well, what is it that we've actually got here? What's the shared method of communication? And particularly for people who have less happening in their lives and need support to actually go out and do things, have we got something to communicate about? Imagine yourselves if you're actually not going out to do things, you haven't been to see people, you haven't come to this seminar, you haven't travelled on the train to get here or whatever else it is that you've managed to get here. And I can say, well, I've sat in my office here in Melbourne and it's, you know, I can now say, well, it's uh, eight o'clock, quarter past eight in, in the evening here. Um, what have I done? I've got something to talk about. If I didn't have something to do, I, I wouldn't have something to talk about, which actually makes all the communication null and void. Spoken language is just, like I said, a tiny part of it. More than 60% of what we do to communicate is nonverbal. So calling something spoken language is actually dismissing the very, very important parts of the communication interaction that we need to do. And we can measure this too. What I've got here is just uh, a lot of examples of natural gesture. But then some people actually use sign, which may not be as guessable as many of these. But for many people with intellectual disability, they are. Natural gesture and sign are part of what you use as a typical communicator, and it's what um, people who have difficulty understanding their world also use. What's really interesting, because I'm also a keyword sign presenter and trainer, is that most people who are on the professional side 
have no idea that this is what they're doing. And so we spend time actually saying, hey, let's think about all the natural gesture that you already use. And if I said to you there's at least 160 natural gestures that most of us would understand and use across culture, that might surprise you. But if that's where we're at, this needs to be part of the communication that is provided to the person. We've got facial expression and body language. And both of these individually and together make a difference to the communication interaction that we're having. And we can measure this and we can label it. But once again, people aren't aware that they do it. They're not aware how much importance it gives. But think again now about what it was like when you were in masks. Well, we were in masks a bit longer, maybe, in Melbourne. Um, I still wear a mask when I'm out. You know, what isn't there that I now have to enhance in other ways? So it's around your eye expression that actually makes the difference. And now it's about your body language, not so much your facial expression that is doing it. We use objects. We use lots of objects in our environment. And people with low, um, with, with poor communication skills find this incredibly valuable. Some people don't understand the symbolic nature of spoken word. Some people don't understand pictures. This person over here is holding a coffee cup. Beautiful. We can interpret lots of things from this. Maybe she's got cold hands. Maybe it's a nice warm thing. Maybe it's at night. But if she now reached out and handed it to you, she's communicating something different. How many of you, when you go down to the supermarket, use objects or not even the supermarket, when you go down to buy your lunch, point to the things that are on display? You're using objects around you all the time. Our environment, and people have mentioned the environment. Now, this is a classroom environment, but we use the environment to help position ourselves in it. Can you go over there? Can you come over here? Go over to the cupboards. Or I'll put you in an adult environment and say, now we're going to go and get a ball from up the top. And now we're using pointing in the environment. Go and stand near the window. You're using pointing and the environment. Go to the door. All of those things is the environment, helping the person to understand their world. And we use lots of pictures and we use photos. And these are just some of the photos, we uh, some of the images that we use in our Easy English work that we do. But each of them you get meaning from. So the person who doesn't actually understand the written word or doesn't understand the spoken word because it is symbolic has now got something to hold their hat on to start to understand what it is we're talking about. I'd like one of those chocolates too, thanks. And here's some more. They're about what is it that's actually sitting here and telling you what's possible or what's not possible. All of these are um, something that Katie um, introduced in her paper, augmentative and alternative communication, when they're used more formally for people who don't use their speech, but yet they have language. So now we can bring language on top of the, um, the interaction. But we also need these things. We need planning and we need memory. We need reasoning and your life experiences, and don't forget your previous success. We also have the term, uh, it's actually the, the official, the complex term is prosody, but it's how you sound when you communicate. You know, we've talked about, I've heard, you know, loud voice and soft voice, fast voice and slow voice. But if I, for example, went compared to no, we get different meaning. How do we measure that? What are we doing here? I went to the movies. I went to the movies. I'm putting emphasis on different words. Okay, so it's not just now the words and the length of the sentence, but it's where the emphasis sits, which also affects meaning. Many of you have mentioned the concept of wait. We talk about pausing and waiting. And then all the different reasons we communicate. And we have many reasons. 
What often happens, though, in a relationship where there's a good communicator and a not so good communicator is the good communicator spends all their time asking questions. Go back and reflect on your own interactions. How often do you ask a question in a conversation? Most of the time we spend our lives making statements. It's called gossip. We're all very good at it. Where does that fit? And why are we not emphasising these sorts of things? We also need to know how to engage with others. How do I get someone's attention? How do I initiate an interaction? How do I initiate a topic? How do I continue a conversation? How do I choose a topic? All of these are part of making successful interactions and successful communication. So Katie introduced that idea of, um, of augmentative and alternative communications. These are just lots of different examples of those sorts of things. What Katie actually showed you was something called a widget, um, which actually is not, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but this is these are communication boards that are topic specific. So you can have a conversation about things when you're playing the game of you know, or when you're playing Mr. Potato Head. about specific topics. This is to help you with your cleaning up, going to the toilet, medical things. All of these things are pictures to help you support your communication. Person's not using speech or they get more complex or they become electronic. These are all part of communication. That concept of easy spoken language when somebody uses this how does that fit together? It's a question. This is young people using them. The one that um, Katie described where it's got a picture and a word for everything, it's called widgets, that's no longer supported by the research. So it's not being used anywhere um, in the English-speaking world. But what do we use? What's already out there? And this is what I want to just finish off with, is saying to you there are a whole lot of other things out there that we need to think about. This is from leadership management. Effective communication checklists. Trust your partner. Learn to listen. Seek to understand. So it's not just about what you say but how you interact. There's a process that speech pathologists use with people who have after they've had their stroke called communication partner training. Eliminate distractions, use picture supports, write down keywords, that's if the person can read. Ask questions to verify, recap. This is a young children's framework, it takes two to talk. Observe, wait and listen. This is one that's been developed for people with communication, but it's just as effective for people following stroke. Say one thing at a time. Don't rush. Slow down. Be patient. These are strategies that are actually in the research in speech pathology. Another checklist, physical space. All of these things are really important. Make sure you approach the person. Make sure they're in their space. Speak to me, not my support person or the fly on the wall. Ask me one question at a time, but let me ask two. Wait for me to have my turn. When it is someone who has more difficulties, it's not just about being short sentences and everyday words. It's about the stuff that we're doing right now. I may not understand beyond that. And let's have a chat. I'm running out of time, so I'm just flipping through these for you. Yeah. I just wanted to finish with this one here, which is the communication access. Communication access has been around for 20 years. This has got a framework based in the UNCRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And it talks about at the very beginning respect and having access to supports and using the person's preferred means of communication and having extra time. And there's training and there's checklists that sit behind this. 
And it's for every different sort of communication. It's not just about interactive. It's about phone and email and meetings and conferences and websites. So I encourage you to have a look at the speech pathology research. Um, in all your countries, there will be speech pathologists that will know about these sorts of things. Um, reach out to them um, and let's share what we're all doing because there's lots of stuff happening in lots of other places as well. Thanks so much. CELSI, spoken easy language for social inclusion. Partners are Zavo Trisa, RTV Slovenia, Dyslexi Verbundet, Universita degli Studi di Trieste, Vieglas Valodas Agentura, Vilnius Universitetas, Vsi Informatio Scaupimo Irsklaidos Centras. Funded by the European Union.